In this episode, we're going to have a look at cameras, specifically how we can create them, the parameters that we can set on them, and the importance of focal length on our picture, on our final result. My guest today is Mr. Matthew, Matthew Perry. I think that is the guy, the actor's name. I've used a head scan to create a Genesis body morph. I've shown the principle in a DAS Plus live stream. If you're a DAS Plus subscriber, you can have a look at that back archive and then I'll show you exactly how I've done that here. It's a bit of an expansion of the series in which I'm showing how to do this with a full body scan. So this is just taking a part, which is just the head scan. And I've created this portrait here that's called Drop It or the Teddy Bear Gets It. So Matthew is going to be our stand-in. I already have a camera in here that was from the original render that I've made. And this is what it looks like. And we're going to have a look at how to create these things from scratch. So as I've already shown you a couple of times, rather casually, if I use my perspective view and wander around and frame up my subject to something that I like, then I can lock in this very view into a camera. And I have to do this in order to be able to access the parameters. So in order to do this, I'll head over here to create new camera. And when I do that, a little context menu comes up that lets me choose to either use the default settings, which means much like any object that I create, it'll spawn in the center of our scene at the very bottom. Or I can use this option here, which means copy the active view, which means in my case, it's the perspective view. So what this means is the camera will be created depending on what I'm looking at. And right now I'm using the perspective view. But if I'd be looking at something else, either a different camera, even if I'm looking through light or if I'm using an orthographic viewport, if I were to use that, then it would mimic whatever the viewport currently shows. That's the way I prefer to work. You don't have to do this. You can literally go and adjust your camera in a moment and we'll, we'll look at both options here. I'll just go and do this. We seem to see no real difference, but that's because right now, although we have a camera, we're not looking through it. So if I go and do that, if I go and look through my camera, I can still move the viewport around and that is now going to be reflected in my camera. And I can use the usual dollying, zooming, transform controls all from here. That is possible. Or alternatively, I can go over to my perspective view again and find my camera. Control F will bring me directly to my camera. This is what it looks like. And then I can go and adjust it like any other object. I can even use the tracking that we've had a look at. And this is where a second viewport really makes sense. If you wanted to work this way, you can go and head over to window viewports maybe side by side and then here being the perspective view this one could then be our camera one and this maybe should be the filament viewport so that we can follow along i might go and give myself a little bit more room here on the left hand side if i go and adjust my camera it'll be reflected in the viewport that shows the camera on the aux viewport if you have that enabled so either of these things will work. Sometimes adjusting the camera handles works better than doing it like this in the viewport, but you can see either way works and either will influence the other. And then of course, the third way, third option is to go to the parameters tab and have a look at the transforms here. And then in case of the rotation, for example, I can use the Y rotation and then that's what the camera would do. Kind of cool to look at it this way or the X rotation or then, of course, the Z rotation, which is the banking. So you have full control that way or with the viewport controls, whatever works for you. Now, one thing that is a little bit tricky to understand for newcomers is that if you didn't have this white area here, what is actually going to end up rendered on my final picture? And on one hand, it's good to know that we have this white area here that is what's going to end up. This is the aspect frame that can, that can be enabled on a per viewport basis. That's up here on the little hamburger icon. Here it is, show aspect frame. If I enable that, then I get this white outline here. If I disable that, then I don't see that. And it's on a per viewport basis. Let me go back to the single viewport, actually, just so that it's a little bit less confusing. And we'll look through the camera here and we enable that. Now we see that currently it says at the top left corner here, it's set to one by one. And that means it will render a perfect square. It doesn't really say what the render dimensions are or what the render settings are, but it shows me the aspect ratio that we're using for this. And that's really handy. 
But then, of course, the next question is, where does this come from? I mean, where do I set this? What if I wanted to render a kind of a portrait? Or what if I wanted to render something like an epic landscape, like really cinematic, like one to five aspect ratio or something like that? How do I set that? That is happening on one of two places. The one that we're currently looking at is set in the render settings. And we'll talk more about that in the next video or in a couple of videos from now. On the render settings tab, under general, I have this option up here that is the size. So for, this is the dimensions and the pixel size. So these kind of go hand in hand. If I drop this menu down here, dimensions preset global, it means I can either set this to the active viewport, in which case I don't see that white outline anymore on aspect frame, because no matter how big my viewport is, this will be rendered. The whole thing will be rendered. So if I go and use the iRay preview now, I don't see any bars left, right or top or bottom because the whole thing is going to be rendered. But if that size changes by me collapsing my bars or by me adjusting the viewport size or whatnot, the render size will also change that way. So be aware of that. So see now everything looks like completely previewed and I can see that this whole area is 1023 by 927. So that's not really a standard aspect ratio of 341 by 309. So I wouldn't really want to render that way. So that's active viewport. Custom means whatever dimension you type in here. And then we have a lot of things to choose from, like, you know, 5x4 or widescreen 16x9. We even have set pixel aspect ratios like this would be something along the lines of 4K. And we're going to talk more about the implications of that on the render engine when it comes to it. But for now, if I wanted to change this into something like 16 by 9 widescreen then if i were to change that here then i get to see this is it 16 by 9 and i can go and frame up my shot the way i want it with this aspect ratio in place i can now go ahead and change the actual render size without messing with the aspect ratio that is being rendered so if i wanted to render a full hd picture then i type in here 1920 and just hit tab and then that'll automatically calculate well then the next the height dimension then is 1080 because that is if this is 16 that is 9 in that kind of aspect ratio Likewise, if I wanted to render a square, I can go and choose that here under square. And then I'll say, well, let me render one that is 3000 by the next one. Hit tab is 3000. So Dash Studio will calculate that for us. And once again, the maths will work. If I want to render something that is half the size, I can just go divide by two, hit tab. That goes to the next one. And that's 1500 by 1500. So that's where the aspect ratio comes in. If you wanted to render something with a custom aspect ratio, say like a three by two portrait aspect ratio, that would be three high and two wide. Then you can go and type that in using custom once again. And if it's not available in the drop down here, you just set this to custom and then you disable the constraint proportions global here because that means now these are no longer linked and you can type in whatever you like. So if I wanted to have something that's two wide and three high, I would just type that in two by three and hit tab, then this is the aspect ratio, as we can see here now. If I wanted for this to be 2000 by 3000 wide, I can also type that in, much like I typed in the aspect ratio. So I'd say 2000 by 3000, and then it would derive the aspect ratio from that. That also works. And then, of course, if you enable the constraint proportions here, then you type in one value and Dash Studio will automatically work out the other value. So that is how we set that on the global render settings tab. But there is another way to set that up, and that is on the local dimensions of the camera. So you may find yourself in a position where you think, hey, I'd like for this, just as an example, I'd like for this to be a portrait, but then maybe I want another camera in my scene that I'd like to create, and that's supposed to shoot me a square format. Uh, so let's let's make that happen. I'm going to go and switch iRay off again so that we have a little bit of a faster viewport. If I wanted to base that camera on this camera, I can literally go and duplicate it. If I don't want to set up the whole shot again, I can head over to edit and then duplicate. Whatever object is selected in the scene hierarchy will now be duplicated. Either the top node with this, or if it has children like a character with clothing, you can use the second option, which is duplicate node hierarchy. So anything underneath it will be copied as well. We don't need it because we only have one camera. I'll just go and select that. And that now means I have, well, camera three. Let me just go and actually name those. It's a good 
idea to get into that habit. So this one here, that was my original camera. I'm going to just call that original. Then this one here is my camera portrait. And then this one, I might call this camera close up there just so that we know which one's which. And as I do that, they update here in the drop down menu as well. So that's that's quite handy to have that. So if I select my camera close up now and even switch into it, then we'll see that it has the same aspect ratio as the previous camera because A, we've made a duplicate and B, we're still looking at the global dimensions and the global aspect ratio. If I wanted to overwrite that, I can head over to my parameters tab with my close up camera selected. I can see something here that says dimensions and that is a camera specific parameter here. On it, I can set my local dimensions to enable. So if I do that, then I have the kind of the same menu that we've seen in the render settings here, but it'll now work specifically and only for this camera. So it's set up to be three by two right now that we can change that, like I said before. But now watch what happens if I switch between cameras. This was the close up one and this is the portrait one. So now we have two different aspect ratios that we could shoot with. That is very handy. So if I wanted for this to be my portrait, I can go to the close up camera and change that to be a square, for example. And I like for that square to be, well, I don't know, you 1600 by 16 or 1800 by 1800 is good. And then I can go and literally zoom in and say that is my, that is the portrait of Matthew and the bear from the side here, something like that. So I could make that happen. And that lets us choose two independent aspect ratios. You can do that for as many cameras as you like. Very handy that. While I have Matthew framed up like this as a square, let me make another duplicate of this camera here, the camera close up, and I'll show you why as we have a look at the importance of the focal length on the camera. Let me just go and make that camera duplicate here. So close up two, close up two is fine. And I'm gonna call this one close up long. And I'm going to call the first one here close up wide. So one will have a different focal length than the other. And I'll show you the implications. And the best thing to do this is to have a look at it side by side. So we're still looking at the first one that we're going to call just close up wide. And let's have a look on the parameters tab here under camera and take a look at the focal length in millimeters. The default value is 65 millimeters, and that is around the length, what photographers would call a normal lens, a slightly longer than a normal lens. So in 35 millimeter or full sensor digital photography, we'd call a 50 millimeter lens a normal lens. Depending if you're shooting with a medium format camera that has a larger sensor size or a larger film back, that focal length would be a little bit different. But that's just kind of a rule of thumb. When, when we have a lens that puts onto our film what roughly the human eye would perceive, we call that a normal lens. Anything that shows more than the human eye can see, we call that a wide lens. So we're talking 38 millimeter, 28 millimeter. Or if we have something that goes the other way. We call that a long lens. Zoom lenses can combine that. Thankfully, we can emulate that effect in DAS Studio. The other option then for lenses would be prime lenses. They have a fixed focal length that can't be changed. They usually have better image quality. They also are usually more expensive. But uh, in DAS Studio, we don't have to worry about that because it's, it's free for us, isn't it? Which is really nice. So we have a zoom lens and we can change our focal length here with this parameter. So if I go and make that wider, watch what happens as I do that. So it's we've already seen the effect that happens. It distorts the perspective. But we also see more of our background here as I change that. So this parameter changing that is in fact doing the same thing as what we did here in the scene tab with right clicking our zoom tool or dolly tool by zooming out. So right click and drag forward or backwards will in fact adjust the focal length, like I said before. And as we do that, we compress the background. We, we literally cram more of the background into our scene. And that means we can now go and dolly in like that. And if I do that, I go and distort his facial features quite dramatically. And it's often not noticeable if you do that, but this is not a flattering look. This, especially for female models, this is not a flattering look. Even this, if I go back to the default of 65 millimeters, just framing it up like that is not 
as flattering as if I were to go the other way. So watch what happens as I do that. I'm going to dolly out, first of all, just go away from him. And then I'm going to go back to the focal length and increase it. So I'm going to go forward now. And once again, it's the same thing that happened with my right click onto the loop icon here, right click onto the dolly icon. This is what were to happen then. So as I go and move further away from him physically and then zoom in, I go and show less of the background and I flatten out the perspective as I do that. And that is in fact a much more flattering look if you're after pretty portraits. But the other way around, like if I do this, if I go into the wide area here and then go and dolly in, then I go, whoops, that, that looks creepy, doesn't it? That shows me something like a devilish look and I, I see more of the background. So in order to really see these things side by side, even with small changes, let me set this up to, well, I'm going to go and think in photographer's terms. I'm going to go put this to 18 millimeters. And then my other camera here that I'm going to call long, select that. I'm going to set that to, let's say, 120 millimeters. I'll go and zoom out a little bit. On my long camera, actually, I need to also switch on the local dimensions to that. There we go. Sometimes it doesn't update automatically. Now it does, so that's that's fine. Shall we go with something even longer? So 120 is already regarded as a bit of a long lens, but real portrait photographers, they may shoot with something like 150 or 200. If I go and go really go to the extremes, if I go on 200 here, and then I go and frame him and the teddy bear up, and then let's go and have a look at the two cameras side by side in two different viewports here. There it is, long and wide. I'll go and give myself a little bit more room here. And you can see that the effect is quite dramatic. This looks very evil. This looks completely different. And there are more implications to this. So not only does it change the facial features or the anatomical features of what you're showing or the background features, it also has implications for depth of field. So the longer the lens is, the shallower the depth of field gets. And the wider the lens is, the deeper the depth of field is kind of automatically. It's all physics, the way the light goes and does its thing in the camera and all that. So those are two things to keep in mind. The other thing that happens is with light effect. So if I go and switch this, switch both my viewports over to iRay, I don't know if my computer can handle it. We'll soon find out. You can see that all the separation lights from the backlight that I've set will have much stronger of an effect in the longer lens than they have in the wider lenses. So if you really want to accentuate those effects, you should think about making that happen. Look at that. So the hair here, I can see that that has a catch light here, and I cannot see that on the wider version at all. If I were to make this a little bit longer, then it would start creeping in. But you can see that this is a big, big difference here between the two versions of Matthew. So if you're taking portraits, and we're talking about portraits in this course, then I would favor a lens between 120 and 200 millimeters here on the focal length. And if you're doing something with architecture and outdoors and maybe indoors, like tiny cramped spaces, narrow spaces, then I'd go into something like 28, 38 millimeters. That roughly, keep an eye on that and see what looks best there. In general, if you have to move the camera very close to your subject, then that's usually not a good idea. And that usually the facial features don't come out in that. It kind of depends on what you want to accentuate. Speaking of depth of field, let's tackle that in our next video.